Good morning. May it please the court. My name is Rachel Baird, and I represent the appellate plaintiff in this case, Richard Burgess. The conduct at the core of this appeal is an act by Mr. Burgess on May 16, 2010, of carrying a holstered handgun outside his clothing into Yale Billiards Hall in Wallingford, Connecticut. In 2012, in a case before this circuit, and decided by this circuit, Kalcheski v. County of Westchester, the court discussed the applicability of the Second Amendment to the use and possession of handguns in public. And in discussing the applicability of the Second Amendment, the court made three observations. One of the observations was that regulation of the use of firearms in public is enshrined within the scope of the Second Amendment. The Second Amendment, according to the circuit, clearly allows the state to regulate the use and possession of handguns in public. Second, the state enjoys a fair amount of latitude to regulate the use of possession of firearms in public. That's what the circuit discussed and stated in Kalcheski. And third, the Second Amendment does not foreclose regulatory measures to a degree that would result in handcuffing lawmakers' ability to prevent armed mayhem in public places. This circuit has clearly ruled since 2012 at Kalcheski that the state can regulate the use and possession of handguns outside the home to, quote, prevent armed mayhem in public places. Well, Connecticut just does just that. Connecticut requires individuals to apply for pistol permits, meet suitable... All right, so your client had a pistol permit, so he had a right to carry the gun. At least under Connecticut law, he had a right to openly carry the gun and presumably the ammunition also. Yes. Okay, so uh, let's assume hypothetically that um, Connecticut... There's, 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 there's no law in Connecticut that, for example... Um, makes it illegal to wear a ski mask. Okay? Yes. All right, so if your client, instead of walking into um, the pool hall, put on a ski mask with his gun and walked into a bank, could he be arrested for disorderly conduct? Well, there's no law in Connecticut that issues permits to wear a ski mask. All right, that's not what I'm getting at. Um... Well, let's, let's uh, assume it's perfectly lawful to wear a ski mask, so that doesn't add anything to the equation in terms of what the, the police officers are looking for. Could he have uh, been arrested for disorderly conduct by doing that? By wearing a ski mask? And uh, carrying a gun into a bank. It, it, by, would the gun have been openly carried or yeah. concealed? It would have been yeah, openly well, carried. Openly carried. From the wearing of a ski mask in combination with an openly carried firearm, one may arguably infer an intent to engage or a reckless disregard for the possibility that others may be annoyed or alarmed, a combination of the ski mask and the openly carried firearm. So in that case, there may be arguable probable cause. Yes, Your Honor. The Suppose you walk together. into the bank with, without the ski mask with just a gun. Then no. There is no inference there of a uh, reckless disregard or an intent to annoy or alarm others. In other words, the state of Connecticut has enacted laws to prohibit carrying of handguns in certain places. And the tunnel start pressing their buttons and the bank guard turns on the alarm and so forth. Excuse me? Uh, when he walks into, in the, on this hypothetical, he walks into a bank with a gun and the tellers start pressing their buttons, you know, the, all kinds of alarms and so forth go up and then the police arrive. Could they uh, uh, have arrested this man for disorderly conduct on those facts? 
No, I, I, I disagree with, I, I do not believe so, Your Honor, because they would get there, they would ask them, do you have a permit? They would then ask the bank, do you have a sign posted where the carrying of firearms is prohibited on this premises, which a private owner of premises has the right to do in Connecticut to post no firearms allowed? So what, I, what if all the, the people in the bank are cowering behind the counter and pointing at him when the officers come in? Do they have probable cause or arguable probable cause to arrest him at that point? Not in Connecticut, because those same people that are cowering should go to their state legislators and say, we want a law enacted where people cannot openly carry in Connecticut. And where's, the, where's the Connecticut law that says you can? 29-35. Says you can openly carry. It doesn't specify which way you can carry. So we could interpret the law just as easily to say you're not allowed to conceal. But nobody has interpreted it in Connecticut courts as saying that the, either 35 or 28, which is the, the permit that your client had here, which is a, a, a permission to carry a handgun outside of your house. You can carry it anywhere in Connecticut except for a few exceptions. Yes. But if you have that permit to carry, where, where does it say anywhere in Connecticut law that accompanying that is the is the uh, right to, to carry it visibly. It Even the Connecticut Appellate Court recently has said we, that hasn't been determined, and uh, the, the Second Circuit has said that has not been determined. The law doesn't state how you carry it. Well, in right. other words, somebody could just as easily theoretically be arrested in Connecticut for carrying it concealed with a permit, because one person might say, "Well, where does it allow you to carry concealed?" Maybe you have to carry openly. If you have a, if you have a, 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 a twenty nine twenty eight permit to carry, you, you can carry the gun. You can't be arrested for that, right? Twenty nine dash twenty eight is the pistol permit statute, right. right? If you have a permit under that, but twenty nine. So if you're wearing it under your coat and a police officer stops you and sees it, but you've concealed it and you show him a permit, he can't arrest you, right? Well, our argument is he can't arrest you if you're carrying it openly either, because under 29-35, which is the criminal liability statute for carrying a for carrying a, a permit, excuse me, carrying a handgun in Connecticut, it doesn't specify where criminal liability attaches. It doesn't specify the criminal liability attaches for carrying it openly. It doesn't specify that it attaches for carrying it concealed. All it says that it attaches if you don't have a permit on your. Permit. Would you agree it's uncertain whether you have that right to carry it visibly? See, I don't agree it's uncertain because under our criminal laws, they're, they're interpreted uh, strictly. Um, the rule of lenity, I argue in my reply brief, the tie goes to the defendant. The disorderly conduct has been construed in Connecticut under State versus Indrasano, and there are two mens rea category, and then there's seven different affirmative acts. And none, the, the, the mere act of carrying a firearm openly while somebody may be annoyed or alarmed by it, under the seven affirmative acts, it doesn't fall under any one of those. It doesn't fall under the uh, physically threatening, because that's the judicial gloss that's been given on disorderly conduct and breach of um, peace to keep them from being unconstitutional, because there's no physical threatening merely by carrying a handgun openly. To follow up on Judge Parker's questions, here he had two uh, spare clips on his belt too, right? He, he did. Is that kind of like a ski mask? Is that more threatening when you're not only carrying a holstered sidearm, but you have two extra clips attached to the belt? No, there's, there's nothing. We, we all have our idea of what is threatening, annoying, alarming to us. But unless it's illegal, unless the legislature feels it's important enough to pass a law to attach criminal liability to an act, how can we simply say something is offensive or something is annoying or alarming to us and but, use but that? But here we're talking about probable cause. Let's say uh, we agree with you. Let's assume we agree that uh, 2935 prohibits only carrying a handgun without a permit. It doesn't prohibit uh, open carry if you have a permit. It also doesn't give you immunity from arrest for probable for disorderly conduct if the police have probable cause to believe that you've acted in a disorderly way. And I expect you would agree with that, am I right? Right, right. So a person openly carrying a firearm who commits disorderly conduct can be arrested. Yes, and I submit in this case that it's a factual issue. It's a factual issue for a jury to decide whether Mr. Burgess going into Yale Billiards 
openly carrying a firearm, where the facts are, from his point of view and other corroborative testimony, that he was approached by someone else who was in an irate state, that the business owner didn't ask him to leave, that when the police came, there wasn't an extensive uh, investigation done of anybody who was annoyed or alarmed. In fact, there was only this one individual whom they interviewed who approached him who was annoyed or alarmed. And but if, we go down that, if we go down that route, then the uh, possibility of qualified immunity is meaningless because you got to, I mean, the qualified immunity is, is uh, intended to uh, uh, relieve police officers and law enforcement officers from the necessity of having to go through discovery and a trial and so forth and so on. But qualified, in, qualified immunity in this case doesn't apply. And I'll get back into a case that I, I, I believe Your Honor, uh, uh, Judge Droney was, was referencing, and that's the case decided in the appellate court where a petition for declaratory ruling was brought to declare that open carry in Connecticut is, is not is legal, that someone can do that because if there's not such a declaration, then it is a de facto prohibition on it because if you're openly caring and all it depends on when you're arrested, if somebody else is annoyed or alarmed, who can control how other people feel? And in that case, the court, in fact, did not say that it's uncertain in Connecticut. The way I read that decision is that the court said Mr. Mr. Peruta in that decision could not have an overall blanket immunity or, or uh, immunity for caring openly in Connecticut, and it relied on the facts at the time. Well, in this case, we do have the facts. We do have an opportunity to release the uncertainty in Connecticut. I don't believe there is any uncertainty. The uncertainty that in Connecticut we're referring to is the fact that different, different individuals in Connecticut have had to bring cases trying to confirm that open carry is legal, and, and because the courts and because various decisions keep going back to, well, there's qualified immunity, as long as there's qualified immunity found by the courts, then it condones the conduct, and the conduct is never resolved in terms of when, when there is arguable probable cause, when there's probable cause to actually make an arrest or not. The starting point is open carry is legal in Connecticut. And our position is, and the, the testimony and the facts in this case support, that all Mr. Burgess did was openly carry. And, that, and, and it ends, and, and from, from our position, that's where, that's where it ends, and a jury should be able to decide whether he had, whether there was arguable probable cause to believe that he had a reckless disregard for others, or that he uh, had an intent to cause annoyance or alarm to others. Thank you. Going straight to qualified immunity, in effect, prohibits the open carry of a handgun in Connecticut, even by a person who possesses a valid permit. It's legislation from the court. And if our legislature in Connecticut felt strongly about this issue, through, its, through the people it represents, then they would take action to specify in the statute that we need to have people with permits carry concealed handguns because in Connecticut, our people are annoyed or alarmed by the mere view of an openly carried handgun. But it's, it's, it's your position that the statute uh, makes no distinction between open and concealed carry. Under that statute, open carry is permitted. That's correct. And I point to three other states in, in, my, in my brief uh, for the history of open carry, concealed carry, e even... Even in Kalchesky, it talks about concealed carry. There's always a discussion. There's always a specific reference to open carry, concealed carry, if that's what's meant. In Connecticut, there is no reference to that, and it's borne out by a state police bulletin that, that confirms that I have. My, my difficulty with this disorderly conduct arrest on arguable probable cause, I would say that if police arrive at a bank and someone is openly carrying a weapon with a large amount of ammunition and other people are cowering behind tables and pointing at them, the police have a reasonable basis to believe that that person has done something threatening. Maybe he's robbing the bank and they have probable cause to arrest. In this context, as I understand, and help me correct my understanding of the record if I'm making a mistake, 
two people call 911 about a person who is openly carrying a weapon in a pool hall. The dispatcher says he's pacing back and forth in front of the, uh, the pool hall when they arrive, and that uh, people have left the pool hall and are upset. So they had, didn't they have a basis, or at least an arguable basis, to believe that your client had caused a disturbance inside? There's contradictory testimony on that. There's testimony that, in fact, outside the pool hall, Mr. Burgess was sitting, that people were uh, around him, that he was passing out pamphlets, that the pool hall, that people were still in the pool hall. I asked the officers, were there cars in the parking lot? Yes. Did you see anybody running and screaming? No. Was anybody exiting the parking lot that you saw? And, and the officers spoke to me. In fact, the officers, when they arrived there, they spoke to Mr. Vanham and the complainant. In clear view of Mr. Burgess, who was sitting on the bench at the time, someone allegedly who presented a danger, but nobody was in a hurry to approach him. Nobody even asked, well, is he in the pool hall? Let's go secure the people in the pool hall. The behavior by the police officers did not exhibit any urgency, any recognition that lives were in danger or, or that they were, in fact, in danger. They, they took their time. They didn't clear the pool hall. They didn't secure the scene. Uh, they arrested him for having the, the gall to, open, to openly carry a firearm in Connecticut. That's what they arrested him for. Thank you. Thank you both.